I want you to picture what your life will look like 20 years from now. 20 years from now. Let's start with the tangible. How old will you be 20 years from now, right? Dead. That's what I heard someone <laughs> say, dead. You won't be, some of you, well, yeah, okay. So, so I'm 42, I'm going to be 62 in 20 years. Like, life will look different 20, 20 years from now. Let me ask some, some other questions. Will you still be living in northwest Indiana 20 years from now? If so, why? Not, what, not negative why, not, not like why. And I plan to be here 20 years from now. I think this is a great place to live. But, but what, what reason would you have for being here 20 years from now? If not, why? What drives that? What will your financial status look like 20 years from now? If you think about how much money you'll make over the next 20 years, even if you just stay at kind of the same salary you have now, add that up over 20 years. Think about how much money you will have made. Think about how much money you will have given in the next 20 years. If you give $10,000 a year, you could give $200,000 over the next, that could make a massive impact in the kingdom of God. If you give nothing, you'll give nothing over the next 20 years. Will you be married 20 years from now? And if you are, what will your marriage look like? Will you be a substantially better spouse 20 years from now than you are today? Do you think in those terms? Think about the biggest thing you're going through right now in life. Probably something tough, maybe even a crisis. The biggest challenge that you have in front of you. 20 years from now, will that challenge still matter? For some of you, it will. For some of you, it won't. All of us, to some degree, think about the future. It's the way that we start to construct our lives. But different personalities think about different distances into the future. When I start to ask you about 20 years into the future, some of you have thought about that already. You actually arrange your life that way so that 20 years from now it will end up how you want it to be. Others of you have never thought about 20 years from now. You think more about like 20 days from now. And some of you think about 20 minutes from right now. But we all have plans. We're all making plans, whether it's 20 minutes from now, 20 days from now, or 20 years from now. And so this is kind of the question I want you to, to think about today. When it comes to plans that you're making, I think there's three entirely different ways to think about that. I'm going to describe all three, and then I want you to assess which one fits you, and you can mark the box on your program, okay? So when it comes to plans, here's the first option. You can say to God, I need God to know the plan for me, right? I have a plan, and honestly, when I think about, am I more interested in, in God being involved in my plan or me being involved in God's plan, the answer is option A. I want God to be involved in my plan, right? These are people who are pretty self-focused. It's, it's kind of humanity in that sense. But our view of God is almost entirely based on whether he's doing what we want him to do to bring about the plans that we have. Now think about this. People who live this way, they actually start to become very judgmental toward God. Because if God doesn't come through in answering their prayers, if God doesn't come through in blessing their plan, if God doesn't come through in healing whatever's wrong, if God doesn't come through in making their life fair, then people start to sit in judgment of God because their whole perspective is, I have a plan and I need God to be involved with my plan. Lots of people live this way every day. There's a second category that's available to you. I need to know the plan God has for me, right? This flips the script a little bit. Instead of it being about my plan, it's now about God's plan for my life. But don't miss this. The, the nature of category number two is that while I need to know God has a plan for me, I also need to know what it is. I really need to know what it is with some level of specificity. You may pray prayers. Nothing wrong with these prayers. God, should I buy this house or not? God, should I take this job or not? God, should I relocate or not? God, should we have another child? Should we foster? Should we adopt? What should we do? God, we need you to show us step by step what's happening. And there's nothing wrong with asking God to direct your steps step by step. But if you put him on the hook to say, this is how it works, God. I need to know your plan all the time. 
then it creates great gaps in our lives when we pray a prayer for direction and we don't get specific direction. Or when something goes wrong in our lives and we think, how in the world at this moment and this time could God be allowing this thing to happen to me? God, you have a plan. I just need to know about it step by step by step. Third category. I need to know God has a plan for me. Category number two says I need to know the plan. Category number three says I need to know God and that he has a plan for me. This is a posture of full trust toward God. This is a posture that doesn't need to know moment by moment everything that God's doing. This is the plan that allows you to go through life and not experience every high as a blessing and every low as a curse. It's the plan that gives God room to work over time and to be active even in the broken parts of life. So which are you? Three boxes. You can be honest about it. Do I need God to bless my plan? Do I want to trust God but I need to know the plan? Or can I just trust God that he has a plan? See, that's kind of the context for this progression of what I'll call the progression of relationship and responsibility. Because we've been talking about the nature of relationship and responsibility, that God loves us, he's our father, and he does ask some things of us. There's a responsibility that goes with it. One without the other is toxic. But as you see this progression, you see this develop, it's always a progression in people's lives. People actually move from one to two to three. People start selfish, and they say, God, I have a plan. I need you to bless it, right? And then you actually move to a place where you say, no, God, I'm more interested in yours than mine. I, I, I kind of need to see, though, as it goes. I need to see how it's unfolding. And then the third one is complete trust. It's I trust God, period. It's a covenant with God that says, I don't actually need to see everything as it's working out in real time. I trust him. And that's the context that we're going to see as we progress our way through BC today. Now, this has been an interesting series so far because you've seen that the, the scriptures are, are kind of an interesting, you know, meddling of stories. I, I have people f tell me from time to time, they'll say, Greg, you know what, I think the Bible, it's a boring book that doesn't have anything to do with life today. And whenever someone says that to me, I know one thing. They haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible actually is crazy, and it has stories that intertwine the same stories that you and I deal with all the time. I mean, we know the story of Adam and Eve, right, and kind of the brokenness with God. A generation after that, there's two brothers, Cain and Abel. One kills the other. Fast forward to Noah. Noah is regarded, get this, as the only righteous man on the earth. But guess what Noah does? He gets drunk, and he curses his grandson along the way. We're kind of sitting right in these couple of weeks from the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the beginning of the covenant story. But, but look at these families. These are not model families, right? So, so from a father's perspective, we have a series of dads who show favor to one son over the other. Abraham favors Isaac over Ishmael. Isaac comes along. Guess what he does? He favors Esau over Jacob. Jacob comes along. Guess what happens? He has 12 kids. He favors Joseph over the other 11. It's almost like Habits can be established generation after generation after generation. Surely you've never seen that in your own families. The marriages aren't any better. Abraham and Sarah are together, but he ends up sleeping with Hagar in order to kind of put God's plan, God's plan into place. Jacob and Rebecca, are at, le at least there's only two of them, but it's not a good marriage. Actually, Rebecca works to deceive, I'm sorry, Isaac, she works to deceive Isaac along the way. The whole relationship's built on that. Then there's Jacob. Jacob ends up having 12 kids with four different women along the way. These people are messed up, right? They need Dr. Phil. They need Dr. Spock. They need Dr. Ruth. They need Dr. Seuss. It's like somebody, like help these, help these people out. And when you read this in the book of Genesis, you might kind of come to the conclusion, what, what in the world is the author of Genesis? What is the problem here? Well, it is not that the author of Genesis doesn't have kind of a moral compass. Actually, the author of Genesis is also the book of author of Exodus, who in a, in a little while, just in the coming weeks here, we're going to get the Ten Commandments. There is a moral edge, something that can be defined. But it seems that the scriptures want to start with these stories, and I think for a couple reasons. One is that stories actually kind of force you to, to work things out in real life. Lists don't work that way. Stories cause you to, to be discerning 
and really try to apply in a complex situation, what am I supposed to do in this situation? The other thing that stories do, and these stories are doing, is they're reminding us that God is actually the hero of all of these stories. And that he is quite willing to interact in the most broken places of life where the brokenness is wreaking havoc on relationships. Now, today we're going to get to the story of Joseph, but I need to, to kind of fast forward you there through a storyline on the way to Joseph. So we, were, we left off with Abraham last week, and uh, let, me, let me kind of step back into the end of Abraham's life just for a moment. He is having a conversation with his chief of staff once, and he, he wants his chief of staff to go and find a woman for his son Isaac to marry. Remember, a key part of this promise is that there's going to be kids and then grandkids, so he, want, he wants this to happen well, right? So here's how that starts to go in Genesis 25. Abraham says to this guy, put your hand under my thigh. That's awesome, isn't it? Like, who does that? Like, put it there, right? We actually call this the Abrahamic oath. And you'll see it happen throughout the, the scriptures. It's not quite to the degree that we talked about last week where it's a covenant with God where you're going to walk through the, the path of some dead animals. But they're always marking these promises with, with one another. And here's what he wants to do. He wants to make his chief of staff promise him that he will find a wife for his son that is a the right kind of wife. Here's what he says. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I'm living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. And then he sends him out to go find this wife. This is actually an interesting storyline that continues its way all throughout the scriptures. What's Abraham concerned about? Well, he knows that the, the covenant of marriage is a really big deal. And if you marry someone who doesn't share your faith and doesn't share your values, that actually is going to erode what's going on. This, this actually makes the storyline all the way through the Old Testament up into the New Testament. The scriptures talk about this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should not marry someone who's not a follower of Jesus. The Bible calls that being unequally yoked. And you can imagine why, like all the challenges that can come with that. But here's what happens. This goes back to our plans, right? Do I want God to bless my plan? God, I have a way I want this to work. I'm in love with somebody. I want, I want you to bless my plan. Or will I step back and say, God, I trust you. I'll follow your plan. So he actually goes out, and in kind of a wild scenario, you should read this for yourself, he finds a girl named Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca get married to one another. And uh, then they're about to have two children. So let's pick up the story here. It says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. And here's the idea. Esau was the firstborn of the two twins. That means he would typically get the family blessing. Jacob, from the very beginning, is trying to hang on to whatever his brother has. And the name Jacob means deceiver. It means deceiver. And we're going to see that play out. Actually, here's how. It says, the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, that's dad, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. So here's the scenario. Dad, Isaac loves Esau. Esau's a strong guy. He's kind of the jock of the family. He's a man's man. <laughs> Harry all over. <laughs> Isaac likes him. But Rebecca doesn't. Rebecca has Jacob at home. He's kind of a mama's boy. And she actually kind of formulates a plan so that when the blessing is passed down, which is supposed to go to the firstborn son, she's going to deceive with Jacob husband and when she does this the blessing passes to the second born instead of the first born it's a wild story you should totally read it yourself when this happens Esau is very mad and so he actually starts to go after Jacob he chases him out of the country and then we get this scenario where as Jacob's kind of on the run he um has this conversation with God. Here's how the conversation ends up. God says to him, Jacob, you have the blessing. All the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Do you recognize that phrase? That's the same phrase that God gave to Abraham in the covenant. 
All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. This is actually the story of Jesus who's going to come through your line. He's confirming that promise. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, another element of the covenant promise. So even though Jacob had come to receive this blessing with deception, God's saying, I'm going to be with you. Now, he doesn't say it's going to be easy. And actually what he does is he sends Jacob off and he's going to put him through a little real life character school that's going on here. Now, uh, this is kind of too long of a story to tell, but, but Jacob goes off, he, he finds some relatives and, and then he, he, he finds a, a gentleman who like he's in love with this guy's daughter, like first sight. He kisses her, he cries, he's like, all right, I want that woman to be my wife. And so he goes to the dad, this is how it worked in those days, and said, hey, I'd like your, your daughter's hand in marriage. The dad, who is um, con man times two, Jacob has met his match here, says, I got a plan for you. You work for me seven years, I'll give you her hand. Jacob works for seven years, and then he says, okay, I'm ready for her hand. Now, this is the younger of two daughters. Con man says, okay, I'll give you my daughter. And on the night they were to be married, he actually tricks Jacob and gives Jacob his older daughter rather than his younger daughter. They wake up the next morning, realize what's happened, and Jacob's like, this isn't right. It's not right that you're not fair, that, that I get deceived, that, that the older one should give the younger. You see what's happening here? All the things that Jacob had done himself, he's now living on the receptive experience of. And the guy says, I got a plan. You work for seven more years, you can have my other daughter. And so he does. Ends up that Jacob fights through all of this. And as he's kind of on his way back to, to the land, this is wild. He has an experience where he's literally wrestling with God. Wrestling with God. And at the end of that wrestling match, this is what God says. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. So we're getting a name change here from Jacob to Israel. Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. That's what Israel means. Is this not the storyline of Israel for the next thousands and thousands of years? That you have struggled with God and with humans but have overcome. So he gets a new name, a new identity. Now, this is the Bible is a little confusing sometimes. I'm just going to give you the heads up on this, okay? So, so then we're going to carry on the story of this guy whose name changed from Jacob to Israel, but when the Bible starts to tell that story, they're going to go back to using the name Jacob again, okay? So this is how it, how it goes. It says, this is the account of Jacob's family line. Now, Jacob is Israel, and here's what the family line's going to be. Jacob has 12 sons. This is what becomes known as the 12 tribes of Israel. The whole rest of the Old Testament is going to follow this line, and you know some of these sons. One of the sons' name is Judah, right? Judah has kids and grandkids and such. Jesus, known as the Lion of Judah, because Jesus has come through the line of Judah, right? Have you ever heard of Levites when they're referred to in the, the New Testament as the priestly line? Well, they're all the children of Levi, who is one of Jacob's kids. Joseph is also one of Jacob's kids. So Jacob had, he had these, these four women that he had slept with, and uh, Joseph is the favorite. Now, in the order, Joseph is actually number 11 out of 12, but he was first born to the woman that Jacob really wanted to be with, and so that's why Jacob loves him so much. And it's kind of odd, but Jacob doesn't really hide the idea that Joseph is his favorite. So this is what's happening. Like, when, he, when he's clothing these 12 boys, like, the other 11, they get their robe off the rack at Kmart when it's a blue light special, Right? But when it's time to get Joseph's robe, we're going to Nordstrom's, right? And he's getting this beautiful coat, coat of many colors, it's called sometimes. The whole idea behind the coat is that this, this one is preferred. Now, Jacob, Joseph has grown up under this with Jacob, and it's not really actually helping Joseph's character much. What it actually does to Joseph is it makes him arrogant. And so when he's 17 years old, he's, he's the 11th oldest of these 12 boys, when he's 17 years old, he has a dream, and he thinks it's a good idea to announce this dream to his brothers. Okay, this is how the story goes. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, I need you to imagine this for a second. First of all, show of hands. How many of you have siblings? You have at least a brother or sister, okay? Now, I want you to think of your most arrogant sibling, okay? 
it might be you, I don't know, like a, a, your most arrogant sibling, and then think, okay, they had a dream, and they're going to announce their dream to, to me and if you have other siblings, and this is how it's going to go. Just put yourself in these shoes, okay? Joseph said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Isn't that a great dream? Hey, I don't don't understand why you guys don't love this as much as I love it. Clearly, I'm the special one, and you're not. Now, this is the structure of the rest of the message. I'm going to show you different scenarios, three different scenarios where Joseph was interpreting dreams in his story. And what you're going to see is this progression of trust in Joseph. It does not start in a healthy place. Now, hear this. This dream was not false. This dream actually ends up becoming true. The question is, how does Joseph handle it, right? And at the beginning of our progression of trust, almost always there's this arrogance. And arrogance goes like this. It's about me and also about me. It's about me and it's also about me. Now, don't miss this. Joseph is going to end up at the end of the story. He's like one of the top five figures in all of Old Testament history. He actually is an archetype, in some ways, of Jesus Christ, who is eventually coming. But it did not start that way. It started with arrogance and Joseph being quite full of himself and thinking, everything needs to adjust to me and my plan. Well, you can imagine the brothers didn't take too kindly to this, so here's what happens. The other 11 brothers get together, and they say, we've got to get rid of this Joseph guy. And so they actually capture him, and they kind of put him down in a well, And they have this conversation. They say, should we sell him or should we kill him? Should we sell him or should we kill him? They end up deciding to sell him into slavery. And then what they do is they take this fancy little coat he had. They get some blood from an animal. They take it home to their dad and said, oh, Joseph must have been killed by an animal. Joseph is sold into slavery. He goes down to the nation of Egypt. Now, Joseph's a competent person, a competent leader, obviously. And so when he gets put into the slavery, he ends up in the house of a man named Potiphar. Potiphar was a powerful man, and he saw how competent Joseph was, so much so that Joseph eventually rose up and became in charge of Potiphar's whole household. He was quite competent. He was in, in a good spot. And then one day, Potiphar's wife comes. She looks at Joseph, says, hey, you're pretty handsome. Why don't you sleep with me? And Joseph isn't going to do it because he wants to honor Potiphar, and he probably doesn't want to lose his job. But Potiphar's wife actually grabs a hold of Joseph's clothes. She takes them off of him, and then she goes and tells her husband, hey, this Joseph guy, he tried to rape me. It's a false accusation. It is not true, but it sticks. And so Joseph moves out of being the head of Potiphar's house to going to prison. While Joseph is in prison, the Bible tells us that two other people get put into prison with him, among all the others. These two people are prominent people. One of them is a cupbearer to Pharaoh, who's always in Pharaoh's presence. The other is the baker for Pharaoh. And this cupbearer and baker actually have some dreams while they're in prison. They can't figure them out, and so they come to Joseph. And this is how that passage goes. They say, we both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Well, this is a little different posture in interpreting this dream than the first one, isn't it? He says, actually, the the dreams, these interpretations belong to God. And then they tell him the dreams. It's actually good news for the cupbearer, bad news for the baker. The cupbearer is actually going to kind of experience some redemption, end up back in Pharaoh's court, and the baker is going to be killed, and they find out about that. Joseph says, in the last verse of of this chapter, he says to the cupbearer, he says, so when you end up back in Pharaoh's court, remember me. Put in a good word for me so I can get out of prison. And in the very next verse, it says, the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. So the cupbearer's back. He's fine. Joseph had done his job. But for two more years, Joseph remains in prison. This is actually how it goes. But when all goes well, let's go back. When all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of prison. Do you see what's happening here? 
You see, Joseph has progressed from arrogance to something else, but he's not at full trust yet. He's actually kind of saying to God, he's saying, yeah, God's the one who can interpret dreams. You should, give, you should pay attention to God's plan. But there should be something in it for me, too. This is how a lot of us relate to God. It's with conditions. Conditions say, it's about God, but I expect something for me. Now, I don't know about you, but I interact with people like this all the time. All the time. People who have this view of God and this view of life. They would say, they have this picture that when they do something, like, they're doing it, and it's for a good cause, but there, there probably ought to be something in it for them, too. This is how we relate to God. God, I'll be faithful to me, and you'll take care of me, right? God, God I'm, I'm doing this for you, but there's something in it for me. Like, I would say 80% of people who are followers of Jesus fall into this category. And you may do it intentionally, or you may do it unintentionally, but that notion of, yes, God, your plan's the best, but you're watching out for me, Right? That's part of the mix here. Now, this is going to progress to a place of full trust in a moment, but let me name this. When people move from being self-centered and wanting God to bless their plans to saying, God, you have a plan, but I need to know what it is, and it needs to help me a little bit, to God, I completely trust you. Sometimes I see that progression take 20 years. Like, it's just kind of day in, day out growth and maturity and reading the scriptures and seeing the work of God and seeing... Like, sometimes it takes 20 years, and I get that. But it doesn't have to take 20 years. Sometimes it's just a decision. I have seen people go from stage one to stage three in 20 minutes. To say, I used to be a person who was about me, and I, need to, I, I see who God is. It has to be all about him. And then there's kind of this, this wild story. So, two years go by. Joseph's still in prison. Two years, don't miss this. When you and I pray and we want God to work, we feel like if we've prayed for two weeks, God should be coming through. Two months? Oh my goodness, come on, God. Two years where you can't actually see piece by piece the work of God, but it doesn't mean he's not at work. Then we get this kind of wild scenario. So Pharaoh then has a dream. Pharaoh goes, gets to all the people who are around him, all the wisest people, all the people who have helped him before. No one can figure out this dream. One day, the cupbearer, who's now bringing a little wine to Pharaoh, thinks, oh yeah, Pharaoh has a dream. Like, bang! You know, two years ago, I was in prison with a guy. He was pretty good at interpreting dreams. I was supposed to tell Pharaoh about him. And so he says, well, this is the perfect chance. Pharaoh, you need somebody to interpret your dreams? He interpreted my dreams. And so Pharaoh calls for Joseph to come and interpret this dream. This is kind of wild. Follow how the story goes. He, Pharaoh says, but I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Get this. I cannot do it, Joseph said. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I can't do it. This is not about me. Only God. And then, get this, Pharaoh tells him his dream. And here's how the dream gets interpreted. Joseph says, Pharaoh, here's, here's the deal. Over the next seven years in your land, you're going to experience plenty. Like the crops are going to grow like never before. You're, you're going to have more than you ever need. And, and you, you could get in a situation over these next seven years where you just think this is normal. Don't think it's normal. This is God's blessing on you for these seven years. And then you have to be prepared. Because after these seven years, there's going to be seven years of famine. And what you will have needed to do was to store up enough over the first seven years so that you can endure the next seven years. Do you understand, Pharaoh? Pharaoh says, yes, I understand. And then what I think is striking about this passage, Joseph gives Pharaoh a little piece of advice. He says, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Joseph is not suggesting himself. He's been down that road. He's been down the road that says, God has a plan and I need to kind of be the star in it. He's at now this stage saying, God has a plan Pharaoh, I'm just going to leave it to you. You need to go find someone who's smart, who's in charge, who can 
manage this because it's going to be 14 years. It's a wild ride. Pharaoh ends up going through a little bit of a discernment process, and he actually does end up choosing Joseph to be that person. And so Joseph becomes the, the person who's essentially in charge right underneath Pharaoh of the whole nation of Egypt, and particularly in charge of making sure that these seven years of, of feasting, uh, don't, they don't waste it all. They have enough for the seven years of famine. Follow this story. So the seven years of plenty go by. Joseph manages it well. He's prepared for the next seven years. They start to go into the famine season. Things are okay in Egypt because Joseph has managed all of this well. But Joseph's dad and 11 brothers aren't in Egypt. And they're experiencing the famine too. They hear that in Egypt they have food. And so Jacob keeps one of his sons home and sends the other 10 to Egypt to go try to negotiate to have some of this food. These 10 brothers come into Egypt and they end up in front of Joseph. Now they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph does recognize them. Guess what they do? They bow down to him. This is the fulfillment of the first dream. And they ask him to be able to have favor on them and, and give them some food. Joseph is pretty kind to them, but he notices that only 10 of the 11 brothers are there. And he says, hey, here, you have a brother that's at home. He's not here. He said, you know, if, you want, if you want some food, you need to bring me back. Bring me back this 11th brother you tell me about. Joseph wants to see his 11th brother. And so he sends them back. They have a little conversation with dad. And, and dad says, no way you're taking, <laughs> taking my, my last one. I'm going to end up lonely here. And eventually convince him. And all 11 go back to Egypt. And they're welcomed in to Joseph's palace. The way the scriptures describe this, Joseph is there, and he recognizes these 11. They have not yet recognized him, but he kind of has everyone else exit the room. And then in a moment with his 11 brothers, he reveals who he is. And there's much crying. There's a lot of consternation. No doubt the brothers are a little bit fearful, but Joseph says, no, it's it's okay. I'm just glad to see you. Here's what I need to know. Dad's still alive, right? Dad's still alive? I said, yeah, Dad's still alive. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back, and I want you to get Dad. And I want you to bring him to Egypt, and actually bring your wives, bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring the whole nation, bring them here to Egypt. They'll be here, they'll have plenty, I'll take care of them. Go, get them, bring them here. Now, I don't know, many of you don't know where this story is going from here, but we're, we're getting toward the book of Exodus. Remember where the whole nation of Israel has ended up in Egypt? You know how they ended up in Egypt? It's through this scenario. And so these boys, they go back and they get their dad. And Joseph gets to see his dad. And there's a lot of kind of tender moments in conversation. You've got to read this for yourself. But then, Jacob dies. And when dad dies, the 11 brothers get concerned again. Because they think, you know what, as long as dad was around, Joseph was going to treat us right. But now that dad's gone, he's probably still mad at us. And then we get this verse. It's the result of this conversation. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? This is not about me. This is only about God and the work that he's doing. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see the posture that Joseph got to? It's the posture that I want to lead you to. It's the posture that doesn't start with saying, God, bless my plan. It's not even the posture that says, God, I need to know what your plan is step by step if I'm ever going to trust you, which isn't really trust at all. It's the posture that says, God, even if I don't know what your plan is, I know you have one. And I can trust it. And before I close this today, I do not want you to miss all the things that God used to bring about his plan. Follow this. He used someone going through 
a false accusation. He used someone going to prison. He used the weather. Seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. He used tragedy and heartbreak and suffering. Because if you and I chalk up God's presence to simply being, I'm going through good things in life, we will have misread God's plan entirely. Instead, what we know is that while we live through the most broken parts of this world, God has a plan. You may not know what it is, but you know who he is. And so he invites you to a posture of complete trust in him. I want to pray for us to do this right now. Holy God, Help us to know that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts and your ways are higher than our ways. Help us to trust you. And to know that even when we can't see it and when it seems to us things are going wrong, that you are at work for good and that you, God, make a way seems to be no way. I pray this in the name of Jesus.